Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Losing my voice already. Shouting out, great is the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Father. We want to remain in your presence this morning, Lord, as we come to your word. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this precious time to commune with the God of all creation. You are great, Lord. Oh, Father, you are worthy. Thank you, Lord. Only you satisfy us, Lord. We come to seek you like never before. Lord, I thank you, Father, that your word is like fire. And just like that fire came last night in that Japanese restaurant and that teppanyaki chef set the whole grill on fire and everybody in that restaurant had to take note. It was hot, it was bright, it was intense, it was unmistakable. Everybody had to stop and pay attention. Lord, I thank you, your word is like that. It cleanses the hot plate. It cleanses our heart. And Lord, your word in Jeremiah said, your word is like fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces. So we come hungry to hear your voice of fire tonight, today, <laughs> tonight, all day, all night. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, open our ears to hear your voice. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 It's good to seek the Lord. Well, I want to unpack some scripture today. And this is kind of part one of what we're going to continue on on Tuesday night at school, we've been talking about eternal things, we've been talking about eternal love, we've been talking about his eternal holiness, that he is both love and holy, amen? He is holy, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, holy, H-O-L-Y isn't he? 100% holy. Holy, holy, holy love at the same time. And our brains find it hard. Our finite thinking finds it hard marrying the two. But in scripture, we see over and over and over and over again who he is. He is fully love. He is fully holy. Now, this Tuesday, I'm going to talk about I'm going to bring a message called Love That Brings Hate. That doesn't make sense to our finite minds either, does it? It doesn't make sense from a worldly perspective. Love that brings hate? Who wants hate? Nobody wants hate, but I want to tell you that true love towards God will bring hate. And that is what is missing in the church. We're meant to be the pillar of truth. We're meant to proclaim who Christ is. And we've talked love, 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 but it's been a false sense of love. Why? Because the heart of man knows that you've, if you talk about love, people will come. It says in Proverbs, what does a man desire? Unfailing love. You talk about love, love, love. It will draw people. But then if you fail to talk about holy, holy, holy... It's another Jesus. See, love, love, love is preached because they know that's palatable, that will bring people into the four walls of what you call church and tithe. <laughs> but why are we not seeing holy, holy, holy? See, it's the holy, holy, holy that will bring hate. And the byproduct of a church that does not see the level of persecution we've seen in the book of Acts, the level of persecution we read in the Bible, is a syndrome, is a symptom 
that we're not preaching holy, holy, holy. And all the more so in these last days. Amen? I haven't seen so much angst in terms of standing for what is right in areas like homosexuality is sin. God will test you in these things. You're going to have to stand in your workplace and say, God loves you. God cares for you. God died for you. God has made a way for you to know him. But for you to stay in that homosexuality is sin. Black and white. You can call me a homophobe. Whatever. I have a family member, a brother, the only brother that really talks to me right now, is my gay brother. <laughs> and we're friends. But he knows where I stand. He knows that I'm with the Lord. And he knows that I will always bring him truth when he asks for it. <clears throat> and if, you, if hate comes your way because of that, so be it. That's loving God. That will be the test. And in so many areas, I can't turn on the news these days without some pride festival, some homophobic story or, you know, denigrating people who, who believe in God, but will stand for what is right. Stand against what is sin. Because that is love. Amen? So that is why we're looking so intently into what true love is. What eternal love is. He said to Peter, do you love me? In Proverbs it says, all a man wants is unfailing love. You know that God is the same. We're made in his image. All God is looking for, all he is longing for, what he is seeking is unfailing love. And that love is holy. And so this morning, I'm so excited that we have the privilege of coming to his word again. Every time we come to his word, we should get excited. Amen? We should be in an anticipation. You're going to speak to me, Lord. In fact, if you can pray that this morning, speak to my heart, Lord. Change my life. You know, one verse, one passage set on fire like that teppanyaki grill last night, set on fire by the Holy Spirit, anointed. It could be a verse that you have read a million times over and God in that moment sets it on fire by the Holy Spirit and changes your life. You know, it all comes back to the book of Genesis. Remember Eve in the garden? And what was the first thing the enemy said to her? Did God really say? Those are the first words. He used to deceive. He used to lead her astray. Did God really say... Now, what should her response have been? Yes! <laughs> she should have known. She should have been meditating on. She should have had it imbibed as a very part of her what God had said. He gave them one command, don't eat of that tree. He didn't even tell her why or Adam why. He just said, don't eat of that tree. She should have been meditating on that. That sounds really important. That's, that's the word of God. But she didn't, did she? She didn't respond to him. Yes, he said that. That's what he really said. She should have been looking intently into that. But instead, she saw something that felt good. She saw something that would taste nice. She saw something that looked good. And in that moment would give her a high of something that seems to satisfy, something that seems to taste good for the moment. 
And what was her downfall? She had not been sure of what God had said. Now on that day, we have no excuse. Did God really say? That's what we're going to look into today. God, did you really say? I want us to go to 2 Timothy 3. And we're going to read this passage, which you've probably read a number of times. But we're going to really look at what God really says. (laughs) Is that okay? Did you really say that? Yes. I don't want to have surprises on that day. I want to know what he said and I want to live it. I don't want to hang my head in shame. We've been talking about living for eternity. We've been talking about last days. Well, here is a passage about last days. And I'm reading from the NET version, the NET version, because it brings out something that's very key. But let's start reading verse 1, 2 Timothy 3. But understand this. So this is again, did God really say? We need to understand this. But understand this, that in the last days, we're in the last days, amen? This is now. Difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of themselves. See, if you don't love God, you'll love something else. And the first thing will be self. It will be a life living for yourself. Or in the voice version, it says narcissistic. (laughs) Narcissistic, lovers of themselves, lovers of money. That's the next big one. Running after wealth, running after money. Boastful, arrogant, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. And here is the opposite side of holy and love together. Here it's unholy, unloving together. Irreconcilable. Wow, that's a strong word. Irreconcilable. Slanderers, without self-control, savage, opposed to what is good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, loving pleasure rather than loving God. Now, we read this passage, and I don't know about you, but I've always read this passage and thought about the world, right? Out there, it's evil, so evil. This is what it's like. God is holy. They are evil. It's almost like I have to repent because... You know, the self-righteous man saying, that man is evil. But I, I go to church. I bring my tithe. I bring my thing to the altar. I do the right thing in front of people. But that man. And so we read this and it's our natural inclination, our sinful nature to think that's out there. But then I want to read on here. We always read the context, right? And the NET goes on. He's just listed all of these horrendous sins. And then it says in verse 5, they will, they, so the same people, they will maintain the outward appearance of religion, but will have repudiated its power. Having... Your version might say having a form of godliness, but lacking the power. But I love the NET here says that maintaining an outward appearance of religion. So this isn't somebody who is a drug addict, dealer on the street, pedophile. This is someone who has an outward form of religion. They go to church. They do the right thing. They say they're a Christian. This stuff. Let me read it again. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving. So it looks like love, but it's actually not love. Irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, savage, opposed to what is good. 
opposed to Jesus, treacherous, reckless, conceited, loving pleasure rather than loving God, they have an outward appearance of religion but lacking the power. Now that power, that word power is dunamis, which has been largely taught as miraculous power and it does have that meaning, but it also means power to overcome sin. And in this context, that makes sense. It's not about signs, wonders and miracles right here. Lacking the power to overcome sin. But having an outward appearance of religion. What? This is about the church. This is about religion. This is the last days. This is what we've been talking about, about this false love. This idea that you're preaching a love, but without the holy, it is not love. It is not eternal. It is a feel-good moment. It is another Jesus. It is a catfish lover contacting you online and here's the thing here's the red flag when you know it's a catfish lover you know what a catfish online lover is it's somebody who pretends to be someone else and then they hook onto you online and they get your affection toward them and you've built a soul tie and they're almost like a boyfriend or girlfriend but you've never met them in person but they're not the real thing <laughs> there's someone pretending to be something else that's like this other Jesus this other form of love that they talk about, but that love doesn't endure. That love isn't eternal. That love doesn't bring holy walk with the Lord. It's another lover. You know what the red flag is? They ask you for money. Right? If anybody contacts you online and you don't know them and they ask for your bank account details... <laughs> Come on, we've just had a whole issue with Medibank Private and, and other companies who've released bank details of people, <coughs> left them open to be stolen from. If anybody contacts you online and asks for money and you don't know them, you've never met them, doesn't matter how kind they seem, how loving they seem, it's a red flag. <laughs> Well, that's what happens in church. Oh, we're going to have a Sunday where we're going to have launch Sunday and it really means come and bring your money <laughs> so that we can continue this kingdom building, man kingdom building, by the way. When they start asking for money, that's a red flag. I'm glad that we have a culture. We don't even have a thing that we hand around. We've never asked for your tithe. <laughs> but a heart that loves God naturally wants to give, wants to obey the Lord. Amen. But that's the red flag. That's in the church. Lovers of money. Self-seeking. God's not talking about the world here. He's talking about the last days, what the church will become. An outward form of religion, but lacking the power. This excuse for sin in, instead of faith. And on Tuesday, we're going to talk about walking on the water. We're going to talk about the faith that we will need in these last days. You need to know that you don't have to manage fear, manage depression, that you need to overcome it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lacking the power. If you give people an excuse, a psychological psychobabble, that you're always going to have this, it's always going to be at your door, it's always, you're going to have to just manage it, maybe take some medication for it. Now, I'm not saying that those things can't be used on the, 
on the road to victory. But the road to victory comes with truth, right? They shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. That it's not an option to overcome fear. It's a must. It's not an option to overcome depression. It's a must. And here's the thing. Is there any fear in heaven in terms of man's fear? Is there any depression in heaven? Is there any anxiety in heaven? So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, do you believe what you're praying? See, this man's psychobabble is part of self. Fear is linked to self. And that's what happened with Peter. And we'll talk that, about that on Tuesday. He had it right, but then something lacking maturity of self came in. Fear is linked to self. Depression is linked to self. Amen? Amen. In fact, it will kill you. You know, last night, even though it was a largely a fellowship kind of time with the ladies, you know, Kylie and I started we can't help ourselves start talking about the word of God. And it reminded me of this verse in Proverbs. Proverbs that talks about the rotting of the bones. Proverbs 14.30. It says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. So a life, a heart at peace or a tranquil heart gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. Now, a heart at peace means free from fear, anxiety, depression, envy, jealousy, unforgiveness. You have those things, your heart is not at peace, right? And it talks specifically here about envy, but I believe it's talking about anything that causes your heart not to be at peace it rots the bones it says in some versions the jealousy is like cancer to your bones that's literal friends i believe that many diseases many illnesses can come from sin the lack of a heart that's tranquil content not always looking at what the other person has and I have to have that, you know, that like TikTok screens constantly coming up and telling me what I should live like, what I should wear, who I should be like, what I should eat, where I should holiday. And, and that becomes something that I need to have. And that's a form of envy. Do you know this fear of missing out is a form of envy? And do you know that those influences get money by making you envious <laughs> and you keep consuming that and consuming that it says it's cancer to your bones it's like osteoporosis <laughs> it's actually going to eat you up physically so fear isn't an option to keep around you must overcome you must have victory over it and that is the power this passage is talking about having a form of godliness but lacking the power don't you think god is more than able to set you free you just have to believe oh you have little faith right the road to that freedom is belief the road to that freedom is fixing your eyes on Jesus and not yourself and what you can do. And I'm not worthy and I, I don't have a wife, I don't have a husband, I don't have enough, I'm not like that person. That is all self. Amen? And it seems like a false sense, it is a false sense of humility. You think that you're denigrating yourself, but it's still self. We must have victory over these things. See, the key to the true church is there will be power. Power to overcome sin and that will be preached. So right here we see the insidiousness of what religion is. 
And again, we need to stop saying them. We need to start guarding our own heart. Because this is a daily thing. I die daily, he said. That was the gospel, right? Did anybody come today to die? (laughs) To die, right? Daily. Every time we come to the Lord, it's death. (laughs) But it brings life, (laughs) amen? And Christ is life. And so he says there's an outward appearance of religion, but lacking the power. Do you know the, the red flag of dead religion is hidden sin? It's called being two-faced. I'm one face here and another at home. In the privacy of my own room. In the privacy of my own thoughts. It's actually an honesty issue, isn't it? Being honest with yourself and honest with the Lord. Now, who knows that if you are in relationship with someone, you need to be honest. When you're not honest, there's a problem. (laughs) It's really hard to be intimate with someone who's not truthful with you well God is looking for an honest bride that's where repentance comes and so if you find yourself and we're all tempted we all live life out it's a daily thing like I said die daily if you find yourself doing something thinking something you know others wouldn't want to know that's religion that's the hypocrisy An outward appearance of religion, but lacking the power. It's a warning from the Lord, isn't it? Here's some scriptures. Hebrew 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Did God really say? He sees it all. He knows it all. You might as well come clean and be honest. He already knows. Proverbs 15, 11, New King James, hell and destruction, or amplified, the place of eternal punishment are before the Lord. So how much more the hearts of the sons of men amplified the inner motives of the children of men. Here's another red flag of religion that plays out through this proverb, Proverbs 15.10. There is severe discipline for him who turns from the way of righteousness and he who hates correction will die. The literal standard version says in Proverbs 15.10, discipline or chastisement is grievous to him who is forsaking the path. The Berean version, discipline is harsh for him who leaves the path. He who hates correction will die. Have you ever heard someone say, well, that's, that's too harsh? You've just spoken the literal word of God. Did God really say, yes? It's been preached from the pulpit and they leave because that's, that's too harsh. I'm going to find a church where it's not as harsh. Well, they talk about love. You don't talk about love enough. Well, that is love. And what, is, what does God really say here? God does not mince words. I love that about him. I love that, that quality. He does not mince words. And he says there is severe discipline. Discipline is harsh for him who leaves the path. He who hates correction will die. That's really clear. I don't want to die. And here's a red flag. If you don't love God's correction, you don't know him. You're not the bride. If you don't welcome his correction as love, thank you, Lord. 
You don't hear his correction in the word and respond to it. Then you're not the church. It actually says you will die. What does that mean? You're not saved. You're not saved. He is both holy and love. And what has come from the pulpit is an insidious counterfeit molly coddling, which forms in over time another Jesus that will send you on a path to death. Now, what I love to do often is meditate on who God is. I love that. And in Revelation 22, 13, it says, he proclaims, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, in the Amplified, the eternal one. We're talking about eternal things, eternity unit this, this season in school, right? I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning from the end all at the same time. See, he's outside of time, right? We are still in time. We are still finite in our thinking and we have a timeline of things. And he understands that and that's why we've been talking about timelines at school. But he lives outside of time in what is eternity of eternities. And he sees the beginning from the end. And we are called to be like God, right? Well, here's the, the way to live for eternity. Here's the way to stay in Christ. It is to understand the beginning from the end of something. So you go down that path of love, 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 flimsy, counterfeit love. The end of that is death. You cannot receive correction. The end of that is death. See, this is how we think eternally. This is how we become godlike. He knows the beginning from the end. He is the beginning from the end. And talking about eternal things, we're talking about the end. We need to discern everything from how it's going to end up. What it looks like right now feels good. It feels good to be loved. It feels good to be part of a nice community at church and be part of things and helping others. And maybe there's older people helping younger people. It makes me feel more fulfilled and more needy, needed. And it gives me a good sense of something that feels good. But if it is not the fullness of the word of God, did he really say? The end of that feels good now says is death. We need to live in that revelation, the seriousness of religion, the seriousness of that path that skews itself off the narrow way and calls itself an outward form of religion, calls itself Christianity. But it actually killed Jesus. Do we see the end from the beginning? That is what it is to live for eternity. That is what he's talking about in this passage. And then he goes on to give us some real keys to keep us in Christ, which I love. And he talks more about, now this is about the church. This is about ministers. Remember, it's a form of godliness. It is an outward form of religion. Verse 6, 2 Timothy 3, For some of these insinuate themselves into households and captivate weak women who are overwhelmed with sins and led along by various passions. So be careful what you desire. Is there any desire that you have that comes before the Lord that you can't give up? Do you desire him? Is he your one thing? Do you desire him more than anything? Your life will play out in a way where it's like Peter leaping out of the boat. It's Jesus. You can't wait to get to church. You can't wait to get to prayer meeting. You can't wait to get to Bible study. You can't wait to get to Bible school. You can't wait to get with the people of God to speak the word. 
He is your one thing. He is your desire. Your life will play out in such a way. Be careful of other various passions that dissipate your passion for God. Such women are always seeking instruction, yet never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. They go to Bible college. <laughs> lots of instruction, lots of information, but never arriving at Jesus, <laughs> the truth that will set you free. And just as Janice and John Bray, John Bray, John Bray's, however you pronounce it, opposed Moses, so these people who have warped minds and are disqualified in the faith also oppose the truth. This is the church, remember? <laughs> oppose the truth, but they will not go much further for their foolishness will be obvious to everyone just like it was with Janice and John Brez. You know, last night as we were coming home, <laughs> I was reminded of the Prince of Egypt movie. The, my kids love that, that cartoon, the Prince of Egypt. And there's a scene with Janice and John Brez, who were the two magicians who oppose um, Moses when he comes to Pharaoh's court to cry out, set my people free. And they, they sing the song, you're playing with the big boys now. Yeah. And it's a classic, it's a great song. Yeah. <laughs> and Genevieve put it up on the screen, and you're playing with the big boys now. <laughs> but it was just such a really amazing encapsulation of that moment. Janice and John Riz. Now, we're talking about the church. We're talking about ministers. They were into witchcraft. God is comparing Janice and John Riz. It was a form of religion. It was a wanting to be seen. Now, here's an interesting meditation between Moses and these two, these two magicians who opposed him. And they looked the part. They could do the first three of those, uh, those judgments the same as Moses. They looked like they could, they had power. They looked like they had the answers. They looked like they were up to par with God. But then, as time progressed, God's power became clear, right? Well, I believe we're still in the first stages of those three plagues where it looks the same to the naked eye. But what is the beginning from the end? What was the motivation? What was their inner motive? We just read in Proverbs about God knowing inner motives. See, in Hebrews talks about Moses, Hebrews 11, and it talks about him in faith. Let's just go there, Hebrews 11, just so we can see an insight into Moses. <coughs> can anyone find where it starts talking about Moses? Verse 23. Thanks. Verse 23. It says, By faith, when Moses was born, his parents hid him for three months because they saw the child was beautiful. They were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 24. By faith, when he grew up, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ill-treated. Let's look at the qualities of this man, this prophet of God choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God than to enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. He regarded abuse, suffered for Christ, to be greater wealth. This is astounding. To be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for his eyes were fixed on the reward. By faith he left Egypt without fearing the king's anger, for he persevered as though he could see the one who is invisible. In some version it says he saw the one who was invisible. It was never the same. Holy and love. This is remarkable. <laughs> this is what it takes 
to be the true church. He regarded the disgrace, it says in some versions, right? The disgrace of Christ, the sufferings of Christ, the abuse suffered for Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now, part of that fleeting pleasures of sin is the love of people, popularity, position, being known, being the head of a church, a ministry, a worldwide whatever, right? Now, let's look at this verse as Janus and Jambres. They're in the Egyptian court before the Pharaoh, the man of the hour. This is like the Australia's Got Talent of the known world then, right? And everyone's cheering for you and you're the man. You are the man. You are the, you know, high up in the ranking of the Egyptian court and you, you serve the, the man, you serve the pharaoh. And this is the epitome of it. This is the apex. I have made it. I've got the love of people. And yet it's all magic. It's all pleasing people. It's all giving them what they want, entertaining them, keeping the pharaoh on side. You know that they would have done magic tricks to do those plagues, but secretly they know it's not real. You know that those magicians on stage, so, so called, that that's deception, right? <laughs> that's not real. That's what they were moving in. They know in their heart of hearts it's not real. But they need to keep doing it to maintain where they are, to maintain the love of the people. That's the fleeting pleasures of sin. It feels good to be admired and liked and popular, right? And Moses could have stayed there. That was, that was the test. He was the prince of Egypt. And then he met God. His eyes were fixed on him who is eternal. And he knew the end from the beginning. Friends, this eternal perspective is what will keep you in Christ. You will give all that up. It will mean nothing to you. All the fleeting pleasures, the things that feel good in a moment. A new car, a new bag, a new whatever. Popularity being liked. That comes and it goes. But Moses got it. He was a man of God. He gave all of that up, the treasures of Egypt, for disgrace. Why? See, that's the sign that you will be willing to be hated because you know the beginning from the end. You will be willing to show that you love God to go through that. I don't want the treasures of Egypt. I don't want the nice feels of having some all of this luxury and materialism or whatever that we can desire apart from the Lord. I will choose the disgrace of God, the disgrace of persecution, the suffering in Christ. Why? Because I know the beginning from the end. That takes faith, doesn't it? That's the church. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, what is unseen is eternal. Are we fixed on what is unseen? And we finish off in 2 Timothy 3. Here's a good news. Verse 10, you, however, he's speaking to his son Timothy, right? This is a father, Paul, speaking to his son, Timothy, who is called to true ministry, who's called to direct the house of God, who's called to keep it true. And he says here with a father's heart, he says, you, however, have followed my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, real love, my endurance, as well as the persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, in, Icon in Iconium, and in Lystra. They had stones in their hands ready to stone the man. Why? Why was he willing to remain in love? Why was he 
willing to endure. He knew the beginning from the end. He had given his life, right? He said, follow me, follow this kind of love. And he said, I endured these persecutions and the Lord delivered me from them all. Now, in fact, all who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Did God really say? Yes. <laughs> Do we take him at his word? Yes. If everybody loves you, you're not walking godly. Hello. Did God really say? Yes. See, Paul is warning Timothy right here, right now, don't go that way of popularity. Don't go that way of man's love and not mine, not God's. All those who live a godly life will suffer persecution. But evil people and charlatans, in some versions it says counterfeits and reprobates, counterfeit, not the real thing. Evil people and charlatans will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived themselves. You, however, must continue in the things you have learned and are confident about. You know who taught you. This is discernment, right? You know who taught you and how from infancy you have known the holy writings which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. That seems like a loving of correction, right? <laughs> right there. And for training in righteousness that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. That word capable means complete, <laughs> competent, able to meet all demands. If you want to be capable, competent, able to meet all demands, you have to be able to receive correction from the word. Right? Now here is the secret to keeping in Christ. He said, you have known the holy scriptures which you have received from infancy. See, did God really say? See, if you really want the Lord, you'll be searching out the scriptures yourself. Don't take it from me. Don't take it from Chris. Don't take it from the YouTube preacher. You need to know the scriptures yourself. Eve should have known that's what the law commanded. She should have had that as a deep conviction in her heart. God means what he says. Did God really say? All those who live a godly life will suffer persecution. You're going to lose friendships. That's normal. You're going to have loved ones who oppose the truth and probably don't invite you to Christmas. That's Normal. <laughs> That's the walk. That's how you know you love the Lord. Now our hearts are soft and loving toward them. But everyone must make their own choice before the Lord. And I will make no apologies to say that I love God first. What does a man desire? What does God desire? Unfailing love. Why don't we stand to our feet we'll just in prayer and communion this morning? Luke 12, 2, NLT version says, The time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. Did God really say? Yeah, he did. So Lord, I thank you for the convicting power, the correcting training in all righteousness power of your word this morning. Lord, we want to take it to heart. Did God really say? Yes. 
Lord, I pray that you would begin to come. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We love you. Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, we love you. Just, just love on him today. We love your correction, Lord. We love your rebuke, Father. It gives me life. It keeps me in you. It keeps me from death. Lord, I thank you for the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord that you come and grip every heart this morning. That if there be anything hidden, Lord, that we would bring it to light. That we would be truly transparent. We would be honest with ourselves and with you. That there would be no hiding. There would be no Adam and Eve hiding with the fig leaves. <laughs> Not even shame. But if only they had taken a hold of, did God really say? This is the moment to take a hold of that. This is the moment for the fire of your word to come and cleanse. Am I being honest with you, Lord? Is there any remnant of that outward appearance of religion, that hypocrisy of that, that they honor me with their lips, but in their hearts, you're far from me? Lord, keep us, guard our hearts, Lord. We don't want hypocrisy. We don't want an outward appearance. We don't want to be hypocrites, Lord. We don't want our love to grow cold like you said in Matthew 24. The love of many will grow cold. But Lord, reignite something this morning. Reignite that flame, that deep conviction of sin that deep conviction of your holy love in every heart. If you want that today, you can lift your hands as a response to him. I want to die daily, Lord. <laughs> no longer I that live, but Christ. I want to be honest with you, God, at all times. I don't want to hide anything. You see it all. It's all before you constantly, 24-7. There's no hiding from God. There's no running from God like Jonah did. <laughs> you will catch up with us sooner or later. You might as well come to him freely right now. <laughs> we might as well do what is right and pleasing. Say, Lord, let me be true to you. Let me be one who gives you true love that you are longing for, that you are seeking. He seeks true worshipers. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We remember your blood. We remember your body. Does anybody have a prayer? I want to pray over communion. We don't need the microphone today. There's no one online. Just if you want to pray a response to this morning over communion. Thank you, Lord.